Aside from being one of the most prominent historians of our time and the pioneer in both cultural history and the history of the book, you have been one of the first advocates of open access in the humanities and a brilliant analyst of the evolution of the, of the historical discipline in the digital age. What's next for Robert Darton? What are you working on right now? Uh, I'm working on two things. One is in the 18th century, where I've spent most of my life. It's a nice place to live if you're not a peasant and if you don't have bad teeth. So those are the two requirements for living in the 18th century. Uh, that's part of my existence, and I'm writing another monograph about it. The second thing I'm doing is I am a part of the campaign to create a new kind of library, which is called the Digital Public Library of America, DPLA. Uh, the basic idea is to out-Google Google, to do for, for the public what Google failed to do. So we are taking all of the holdings of research libraries, more than 2,000 libraries, and we are making them compatible in a single network so that everyone in the United States, but also in Italy, everywhere in the world, can have access free of charge to the holdings of our research libraries. We, uh, I could give you details about this, but it's a, it sounds utopian to make libraries available online free, but it's not utopian. We are doing it, and we uh, have been working at it now for three years. We already have 14 million volumes available, and uh, we are going to succeed. There are plenty of problems, but this is, I think, a great step in the democratization of access to knowledge. You have been awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Obama for your determination to make knowledge accessible to everyone. During your career, you have been a great historical communicator, striving, striving to make history, I quote, a satisfying experience for ordinary readers, one that enlarges the understanding of the human condition. How is this task changed by digital technologies? Is the voice of the historian amplified by these new modes of communication, or is it overwhelmed by the myriad of different centers of authority the internet gives voice to? Well, it is easy to feel overwhelmed, because there's so much information out there, and we all talk now about information overload. I don't know how you say that in Italian, but it's a problem that exists elsewhere. Now, one point is that information overload is not new. It existed in the 16th century. I have a colleague, Anne Blair, who's written a book about the sense of being overwhelmed by books. Uh, no one could read all of the books available in the 16th century, so they suffered from the same impediment, really, to uh, writing things of your own, developing your own ideas. But of course, today is different from the 16th century because we are bombarded every day by information through the internet. Uh, now, is this making life harder for historians? Well, yes and no. Uh, yesterday, I was trying to find something on Gallica, the French uh, digitized collection, and I couldn't find it. I kept clicking here and clicking there, and soon I was lost in this labyrinth of clicks. Uh, I love Gallica, but my point is, it can be difficult to find your way. Still, these disadvantages are trivial compared with the advantages. The advantages, I think, are spectacular because we now have, within reach, digitized resources uh, beyond dreaming. We 
had access to the holdings of the great research libraries everywhere in the United States, but also in other countries. We had search engines and uh, codes, which do make it possible, despite the difficulties of Gallica, to locate information. We can print it out. Uh, we can uh, search it using special techniques and do so-called digital humanities. But I think for myself, um, the great advantage has been bringing together a vast amount of research, making it available on a website, and then writing a regular book. But in writing this book, I feel free, uninhibited, in a way I never did before. Because before, I had spent many years in the archives, and I had index cards. We probably never used index cards, but little cardboard cards. You fill them out by hand with the manuscripts next to you. You put the cards in a shoebox, and you accumulate shoeboxes full of cards. So I had many, many thousands of cards. My problem is how to make available in written form as a book all of this information. So the way I solved the problem, I hope I've solved it, is to create a website. It's Robert Darnton, one word, dot O-R-G. It's an open access website. It can be consulted by anyone. And on it you have thousands of transcribed letters from booksellers in the 18th century, not just booksellers, but also authors, publishers, and smugglers, because most of the Enlightenment is published outside France and smuggled into France. So it's possible, because of the richness of the archives, to reconstruct an entire literary system online. And my readers can then consult different aspects of it and find their own path through my website, which is designed in layers. Uh, so they can go to a city, Besançon, they can click down, get basic information about the industry, the cultural institutions, the politics of Besançon, they click down more and they get access to copies of letters. There were 187 letters of a particular bookseller in Besançon called uh, Charmé, Charles Antoine Charmé. Uh, you know, letters of booksellers from the 18th century don't exist. These are unique. Um, and then uh, if you, the user, are interested in the, getting closer to the original sources, you click down another letter and you have the digitized manuscripts of the letters because a transcription is always imperfect. My point is the reader can follow his or her way through layers of data. That's just Besançon, but I've done other cities in France and my research took me through 50,000 letters. 50,000 letters of everyone who had anything to do with books. Uh, I've been working in these archives, which are in Neuchâtel, Switzerland, but also Parisian archives since 1965. And now I can bring it all together in a website, but I then want to write the book. So I've finished, uh, a, it will be in two volumes, i finished the draft of the first volume, and in writing it, I have a sense of liberation, because I don't have to prove everything by citing manuscripts in footnotes. I refer the reader to the website. Uh, so, and the website has images, it has maps, it has all kinds of things, and therefore, Although you could say this is a traditional kind of scholarship, 
It's a liberating kind of scholarship. So, and many people are doing this now. Uh, students, probably you, are doing the same thing. You can create a website, put your footnotes and bibliography on it with documents, and then write a book which can be shorter and more fun. How is your feeling about writing? And which are your traits about the good, well-written book of history? Well, first, writing, of course, as you know, because you've written a master's thesis, probably, it's hard work. And I think you have to write draft after draft after draft. Um, I don't think there are any tricks. Uh, in my case, I, I was a little bit unusual because I began as a newspaper reporter. So uh, when I was uh, a young man, uh, I was working in police headquarters and uh, I would have to go to the scene of a crime or a fire and interview people uh, and come back with notes, transform the notes into maybe 500 words or 800 words uh, of a newspaper article. It had to be clear, it had to be accurate, no jargon, uh, it's intended for the general reader. Now, I'm not recommending that all of you as graduate students go to police headquarters, but I think in my case, it created a sense of respect for the reader. I try to write in a way that does not condescend to the reader, but that is quite legible. At the same time, I want to communicate new research and new ideas. Now that's difficult because it's as if I am writing for two publics. One, the learned public of professors and students, and two, the general educated public. It's difficult to bring this together, and maybe I've not always succeeded. Sometimes I write, write very academic monographs. But in general, I want to do writing of this kind. And I think often there is a problem for academics because uh, one, one professor writes for other professors. And really, who cares? Uh, well, it's important, of course, to communicate new research. But I think we have almost a responsibility, a duty to the general public because we are trying to explain the human condition. And the human condition, I believe, um, to be understood, needs to be understood in a dimension that takes the reader deep into the past. It's especially a problem in the US where we have so little history compared with you. So, you know, walking around Padua, I'm seeing the Middle Ages, I've seen the Renaissance, a good bit of Roman antiquity. Uh, the layers of experience are so deep. Uh, U.S. citizens often assume that the past is reality, and it has always been more or less like this, and always will be more or less like this. Well, that's wrong, and we need to, I think, deepen the consciousness of people so that they can know how ancestors lived 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000 years ago. Thank you. Um, you have been uh, and are a strong advocate of free access to academic knowledge, participating in important and pioneering projects such as the Gutenberg E, the Digital Public Library of America, and the application of an open access policy to Harvard research papers. Despite your and many others' efforts, uh, it is maybe safe to say that the World Garden model is still the prevalent model for the diffusion of scientific knowledge, especially to the humanities, or at least in Italy. How do you see the future, the future of open access in our field of studies? And how do you judge the acts of civil disobedience exemplified by websites that grant illegal or extra-legal access to academic copyrighted material and epitomized by the tragic death of Aaron Schwartz in 2013? 
Well, the Digital Public Library of America is a serious institution. I mean, we are really going to create a, a world library. So we have to be extremely careful uh, in the policies we adopt. By that, I mean we must respect copyright. Now, our biggest problem, believe it or not, is copyright. Why is that? Well, as you probably know, the copyright laws make a text uh, available only to the owner of the text, the author and publisher, for the life of the author plus 70 years. In practice, that's more than a century. So when we digitize the holdings of libraries in the United States, most 20th century literature is not available. Nothing is available uh, after 1964, and very little is available after 1923. I think this is absurd. Uh, it means that the public domain has been fenced off by copyright in such a way as to reserve our cultural heritage to a very small number of people. What can we do about this? Well, the ideal thing would be to have a reform of copyright worldwide. It's not going to happen. There are too many vested interests. And I often hear professional authors in a romantic way saying, there is some writer in a garret who is doing poems or songs or novels, uh, eating a, a half a loaf of bread a day, and that artist needs to be supported by the public and protected by copyright. Of course, authors should be able to live from their writing. I don't contest that for a minute, but most books, especially in fiction, sell for often a few months, even weeks, rarely more than a year, almost never more than five years. So these books are sitting on shelves of libraries being unread, except for a few people who go to the library, and the public, the public is denied access to them, but the author is not making any money from them. So it's absurd. It's irrational. We need a system whereby all of these books can be made available and searchable so the reader who has a special interest in some aspect of literature, of sociology, anthropology, uh, any field, can locate that material. Well, we are trying to deal with it in the US, and we are not the only ones. Uh, the Scandinavians have succeeded best, so they have created what are known as extended collective licensing agreements. According to that, every book ever written in Norway is available to every Norwegian. Every single book, the totality of Norwegian literature. Now, they have not abrogated copyright, but they have created a small pool of money, and the author gets a small royalty every time his or her book is downloaded. That's better than getting nothing at all because the book is no longer read. So we are thinking, can we do this in the United States? You need legislation to do it. You may have heard we had elections recently in the United States. Things are not looking good for American culture and libraries in particular. So we don't really dare depend on our politicians who are not very progressive in general. What can we do? Well. Uh, I could go on and on, but the biggest hope actually is in the courts because the Copyright Act of 1976 has a special provision 
uh, provision article number 107. And that article says that copyrighted books can be used without the permission of the owner for certain purposes. It's called the fair use clause. And that means that, for example, people with bad eyesight or who are blind can read these, have these books read to them free. But it also means for certain circumstances, I can assign these books to my students for teaching purposes. And now the courts are beginning to feel that teaching is much broader than just one class in a classroom. So our hope is that the public interest will be recognized by the courts and the fair use provision will be expanded always with the possibility of reimbursement to authors whose books are being used. Uh, we hope that this will work. I could go on and on. <clears throat> We've created another organization called the Authors Alliance. So I'm, I'm one of, of the founders of the Authors Alliance. We try to persuade authors to make over their, the use of their copyrights to the Digital Public Library of America or any um, website so that book can be read free. The author gives up royalties, but since most authors are not collecting royalties anyway, it's no loss. It's a gain because what do authors want? They want readers once the book no longer sells. So I think that this is a good way to enlist authors in an attempt to really democratize uh, access to learning. I, I'll give you an example. I published a book way back in 1968. It's still in print, but published by the Harvard University Press, but it doesn't exactly sell many copies. I make enough in royalties from this book to take my wife out to dinner once every three years if she pays half the bill. <laughs> so that's typical of an academic writer. I respect writers who are professionals and depend on writing, but we can create a system in which they can opt out and be protected. So we're on the edge of solving the problem of copyright, but we're not there yet. Thank you. In 2009, your presidential address to the American Historical Association, you pointed out how every society is an information society. You sought to describe 18th century France news as collectively created multimedia narrations conveyed through oral networks. Do you see a parallel between 18th century public noises and today fake news? Shared through and amplified by social media, can the former be used to better understand the later, their information, their diffusion, their reception and appeal? Well, the very concept of news has a history. News was not always the same thing. Um, it, has evolved over time. So people's notion, expectations of what is news has changed. The example I took from the 18th century was a time when in Paris, around 1750, there were no real newspapers, not newspapers with news in them as we understand it. They called them journaux, but uh, they really just told about when the king uh, was going hunting or uh, when a treaty had been signed, but you didn't find out anything about power and contests for power. So how did the Parisians know what was happening? The answer was uh, they would go to certain places where there was oral discussion. So it was an oral distrib distribution network completely outside of the law. 
there was a special tree in the gardens of the Palais Royal called the Tree of Krakow, where people went to pick up gossip about current events. Then there was another way of diffusing news that I found especially interesting and that might make you think of Facebook today. Everyone in Paris had in his or her head a repertory of tunes, melodies, just as you do today. I'm sure all of you have uh, in your heads the same melodies, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 50. Uh, every day, Parisians would improvise new stanzas to old tunes. The stanzas were about current events. And then they would sing them in the streets. Paris was full of songs. You should imagine a city with professional street singers everywhere, people singing at work, people singing in pubs, in cabaret, and so on, uh, and loving the latest verse about Madame de Pompadour or whatever. So I have in the manuscripts located hundreds, even thousands of verses of songs, and then uh, I had a problem because they would say sung to the tune of, and they would give the name of the tune, La Béquille du Père Barba. Well, no one, I had never heard of this tune. So what, what was the music? And did the music matter for the meaning of the song? Fortunately, in the Department of Musicology, in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, they have keys to tunes. So you look up the title of a tune or the first line, and they give you the musical annotation. Now, I have a friend, Hélène Delavaux, who is a cabaret singer in Paris. She recorded the songs as according to the original music, but using verses that were commentaries on politics. And uh, the book I wrote, which is about street songs in Paris, has an appendix with the this, texts of uh, 10 songs, and then you, the reader, can click onto a website and hear Hélène de la Vaux singing them. So it's as if you are sing hearing the past. It's a new kind of historical research in which the sounds of the past become available. That's an example of the opportunities of the new electronic world. Is it like Facebook? Well, in a way it is, because people using Facebook or some blogs of various kinds often see films or hear songs. Uh, they don't just get words. And these snippets, these small um, sung or spoken texts are not at all like newspapers. They're more like what the French people were hearing in the 18th century. Thank you. Um, last week, the Trump administration released a budget proposal that would eliminate the national endowments uh, for the humanities and for the arts, among other things. Although, although it is only a declaration of intent for now, this has been interpreted as a statement against the liberal elites supposedly the only consumers of arts and humanities. How do you think, uh, how should academics react to such statements, quote unquote? Well, we must protest against Trump's plans to eliminate a series of institutions where, which are of great value to the public, and not just to the sophisticated public of college professors, and journalists, but to a general public. Now, it's true that many people in this general public voted for Trump, and he has a rhetorical technique of exploiting their prejudices uh, in order to win votes. 
So I cannot deny that as a member of, if you like, the liberal elite a professor at Harvard, uh, that uh, I am not the target of Trump, not me personally, but people from my milieu. And I think we must take this seriously. So what do we do? Well, you can't believe the number of petitions I have signed. Uh, we are protesting, and we're protesting through our representatives in Congress, our senators in Congress, also through institutions who make collective protests. What is threatened is, uh, as you mentioned, the National Endowment for the Humanities, whose budget, by the way, is very small, the National Endowment for the Arts, but also an institution you may not know called the Institute for Museum and Library Services. It is a federal agency through which large amounts of money are distributed to public libraries not to Harvard, but to libraries in small towns or urban neighborhoods that are desperately in need of funds. And ordinary people use these libraries. I am convinced that a public library in a small town is the nerve center of that town. It's the heart, really, of communal life. It's not the church, although churches matter. It's certainly not the mayor's hall. Uh, it's the library is where people go, not just to read books or newspapers or, news or journals uh, or to get videos and CDs. They also go for advice about how to find their way through the internet. Many of them do not have computers. Many are unemployed. If you don't have a job, you can't look for jobs in the newspaper because the ads in newspapers have all gone online. You go to the public library and there you are provided with a computer and shown how to use the computer, how to do searches for employment. You know, the employment and the unemployment in the US has dropped to 4.5%. We have virtual full employment. And I think libraries are one of the reasons for this drop. So we have rethought the whole nature of the public library. And if you pull the funding out from under the public library, you really damage the economy as well as uh, people's cultural life. Small businesses, go to the libraries to get information before they organize investments and build buildings and make machines. So I think that the Trump administration does not appreciate the importance of libraries uh, for very concrete things, even for business. But the supreme importance, of course, in my view, is cultural. I think culture is absolutely central to everyone's existence. And so if you get a, an ignorant and vulgar person as the president of the United States, um, that is a threat to something that really matters in people's ordinary lives. It's a difficult moment and we don't know what will happen. But I must say, the Digital Public Library of America does not depend on the federal government. We get our money from private foundations, and we are doing money-raising funds. So I think that unlike most European uh, institutions, uh, we can exist outside of the government. We thought of the idea in the first place. It was not an initiative the government and we can make it happen because there is, a, I think, a spirit of public mindedness on the part of private individuals. Um, so I hope that this commitment to the public good outside of the state it will be adequate to get us through this difficult moment. But I have no idea what will happen.
And now with the last question. Uh, we all know the crisis of books, but we hope and fight that the situation will change. Uh, in one of your book, the future is possible and it is a possibility. I ask you if you think there will be a future for humanistic research and which direction it will take. A future for humanistic research and books. Well, you know, I'm not very good as a prophet of the past, uh, not to mention prophesying the future. So I do not pretend to know what will happen. Uh, you know, uh, American citizens tend to be optimists. And you sophisticated Italians sometimes think we are naive. Uh, and I admit I'm an optimist, despite Trump. So, when you think of the humanities, understood in a very large sense, they have been an important part of everyone's existence. And not just college professors and professional writers, but ordinary people. Ordinary people, I think, simply don't grow corn and mend shoes and run buses. I think they are people who need meaning in life, that human beings are beings for whom meaning is really central. And that is the area of the humanities. Now, it could be that the meaning is transmitted through the church. It could be that uh, things are made meaningful through ceremonies and rituals that take place before or during football games, uh, certainly in cinema, uh, often in exchanges among friends. There is a culturally shaped dimension to interchange and language itself. So it would be, I think, inaccurate to dismiss the humanities as a kind of decoration on top of something that's more real, such as the economy. In fact, the economy is shot through with cultural ingredients. After all, what is trust? What is credit? What is money? I mean, it's a piece of paper. And that piece of paper has meaning, too. Uh, what about the euro versus the lira, or the deutsche uh, you know, the deutsche Fund? So I see uh, meaningfulness as absolutely central, as permeating all activity. And because my approach to history is, if you like, anthropological or ethnographic, uh, I'm with ethnographers who study systems of meaning, not divorced from power, uh, from economics, but as something that is not separate, but that is integrated into these other spheres of activity. So the future of the humanities, it will exist. We don't know what form it will take. Uh, maybe the PhD will be threatened. Uh, things will change, of course. But I really uh, feel optimistic that because meaningfulness is so central to human existence, people who study meaning, who make meaning, who shape the meaningful dimension of life will be crucial. And uh, you know, maybe a hundred years from now, they will be studied. Could be there will be folk singers and football players as well as poets and philosophers, but they will be studied a long time from now. So I admit to optimism. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.